I've given you uh, notes on pages uh, 64 to 72, which, which are uh, the pages for chapter 5. So, uh, I tried my best to get into the dispensational doctrine thing like we talked about doing. Oh, man. You know, it's like torture for me to have to do that stuff. And I, I will, we will do it, but I just could not. It, it, it's tough teaching to me something that I can't believe. <laughs> it's like, I mean, it, it was torment. I really tried. and I, There's some stuff in there that we really do need to cover, but, uh, but I'm going to figure a better way of doing it. But anyway, there's a few things in chapter 4 I still want to talk about. And if you'll turn to page 57, we'll get there in just a second. But chapter 4 is about the throne, not about the rapture. So uh, why don't we pray? Let me, let me pray for us. Father, we ask you to bless us and be with us. We thank you for these wonderful people that want to come and learn your word. And Lord, we have an interest here. Father, I pray tonight that things will go smoothly and go well. We'll be able to communi- communicate properly. Uh, and that, Lord, you'll bless us. And uh, you said there's a special blessing for those that read and hear this book. And so, Lord, we ask you to be with us in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Nobody says amen anymore, do they? We just say <laughs> hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> That's accurate. <laughs> That's why the Bible is. That's good. Uh, chapter 4, page 57. Uh, um, what I want to talk about, it, it, it's about, it's about the throne, and it also includes in there the, the thrones of the 24 elders, which sit upon the thrones. Now, what these represent, if you've read it, is, is the fulfilling of the Old Testament, the 12 tribes, and the New Testament, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. It's the coming together, the merging together of the covenants in a fulfilling way. But they're on thrones. So when you get into thrones, you're talking about reigning. So we're talking about people reigning with Christ, overcomers, um, those who conquer. When you're talking about thrones, those are the kinds of things that we're talking about. Uh, I want to read on page 57 in the right column. uh, uh, where Matthew Henry's quoting, where I'm quoting Matthew Henry over here, it's about uh, two thirds of the way down, and it starts with the words "elders," "presbyters," represent the whole Church of God, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament state. This is not the ministry of the church, but rather the re- representatives of the people. Uh, their sitting denotes their honor, rest, satisfaction. So, so when, when you're talking about the thrones, you're talking about some kind of merging and ruling of the Old and New Testament. This is what, we're, this is what we're, we're seeing. Let's keep reading here. It is sad that modern theology, which determines modern doctrine, does not and cannot see the church as ruling and reigning with Christ. Modern doctrine would rather talk about superior angels upon thrones than to say the church is upon the thrones. As mentioned previously, these elders will sing a song in 510 that said the Lamb's redemption hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So what I want us to see was that, that, that this particular, these thrones aren't angels. These thrones are, are a co- combining of together of the Old and New Covenants, the 12 and 12, And coming together on thrones. And then Revelation 5.10 says this. Daryl, can you adjust that projector just a little bit? Move it to the right. Maybe I think. Would would that help a little bit? It says, uh, and hast made us unto our gods kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Uh, The whole purpose of what Christ does in us is bring us into being kings and priests. A kingdom of priests. Uh, and, and so to, to project these things as dispensational doctrine does as special angels and, and those kinds of things, to me, is just wrong. Uh, it, it, uh, we're, we're reigning with Christ, and we're going to be working here just a little bit. Also in, in chapter 4, it talks about something else, and, and all of you, or nearly all of you, are familiar with, with this thought. 
But it also talks about the four creatures or the four beasts. In uh, Revelation 4, 6, it says here, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne. Now, what does, what does that say? Where, uh, were the four beasts full of eyes before and behind? Where, where are these beasts located? Around the throne and in the throne, right. So they're not only around the throne, but these creatures, these beasts, are also in the throne. And if you're in the throne, then you're ruling, correct? I mean, this is, right, if you're sitting in the throne. And 4.7 says, and the first beast was like a lion, the second beast was like a calf or an ox, and the third beast was the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So, I mean, I know that most of you have, have heard me talk about this and, and teach on this, but the creatures are in the throne and around the throne. Now, Ezekiel saw these same guys and, and, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 1, and you can just take these notes, and they're in your notes as well, but Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 10 sees the same, the same guys as for the likeness of their faces. They had, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox. On the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. Uh, Ezekiel not only saw them, but Ezekiel tells us what they are and who they are. Uh, in, the, in, in, chap, in verse 5 of that same chapter of Ezekiel, here's what he says. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Now the word man there is the Hebrew word Adam or Adam. Uh, it's used 17 times in the scriptures. It's, it's used many, many times in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. But, but it's only used 17 times specifically talking about the first man, Adam. All the other references here are, are specifically talking about humanity or mankind, which is what the word means. It means ruddy, i.e., or a human being, an individual, or the species, mankind. So this word, what, what, we're, what we're seeing here are these faces. Ezekiel tells us that these creatures, these the man, face of a man, the, the, these creatures with the, that have the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle, and the face of a man, they're in the likeness of humanity. Now, you know, I, I, I know I can't take time to teach that teaching, but, but, but what, what, when you study the Bible and you find that, that when you study the ox or the lion or the eagle, what you find is that it's really not talking about a bird are animals. It's really talking about people. And so I've got some scriptures here in your study that we're going to read and, and look at so that it'll help you just a little bit. On page 59, the right column up at the top, Isaiah 40 and verse 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. <laughs> Sure, you see, it's always like this. So we're, we're always, it's always relating these creatures, or these, like in this particular case, the, the eagle, to a person. In 1 Corinthians 9, 9, it says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen, or saith he it altogether for our sakes? In other words, is he talking about ox, or is he really talking about us? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. So it's really not talking about an ox or an animal as much as it's talking about the characteristics of a person. The ox temperament is, as you've heard me teach it, is, is a person you can muzzle. They'll let you because they just don't want to fuss with you. you know? So they'll, they'll let you just about get away with anything. And so big old animal you know, can let anybody uh, rule them. And then Proverbs 19, 12, it says, The king's wrath is as, a roaring, is, the, is as the roaring of a lion. Is it really talking about a lion here, or is it talking about a king's wrath? <laughs> but his favor is as dew upon the grass. So, and the, the righteous are as bold as a lion. 
And so on and on you could go. And in the study that we do on the temperaments, we, we go through this to develop and see what temperaments that we are. But around the throne are these personalities, are these people. They're in the throne and around the throne. Now, those around the throne will break out into praise and worship. Those in the throne are overcoming, ruling, and reigning with Christ. And so, and so what I'm wanting us to see here, and when these 24 elders, uh, uh, yeah, these 24 elders as the consummation of the Old Covenant and New Covenant coming together, and also these creatures that are there, what we're talking about is humanity ruling and reigning with Christ. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5 says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Is this when you die? <laughs> or is this now? You were dead in sin. You were born again or resurrected from death. And when, you, when that happens to you, you, become, you begin an overcoming life and you're caught up and made to sit together with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. You're, see, you're seated right now in a throne or a ruling position where we'll reign with him on the earth, Revelation 5.10 says. And then verse 320, Revelation 3.21 says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. And so the 24 elders and, the, you know, the, the dispensationalists will, will try to make those special angels, you know. <laughs> These are angels that rule, you know. <laughs> they rule other angels, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but when you look at it and you put the scriptures together, you find that what we're really talking about here with the elders and the beast are overcoming people who have committed their lives to Jesus Christ, have, are overcoming and are now ruling and reigning. They're ruling their lives, and actually they have authority in the dimensions of the Spirit. So the 24 elders and the four living creatures speak of the fulfilling of the old covenant and the new kingdom, and the new covenant kingdom, and they are ruling with Christ. Okay, I just wanted to touch that before we jump into chapter 5, so you should have your chapter 5 notes. So let's get over there. Uh, page 64. What did I say? Okay, that's actually chapter 5, so you can cross out that 4. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is already confusing enough, isn't it? <laughs> I see it, I see it now. I've had it all week right before me, but I haven't seen it all week, but I see it now. But anyway, and also the Revelation 5.1, I've got there twice as well, so you can X out one of those. <laughs> It is. <laughs> Stephanie says I'm just I just don't have it together today anyway, so it's a good day to I'm gonna go ahead and make all my goof ups today so that from now on I won't make any more, okay? Uh, that's, that's my first one all year. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. First <laughs> Yeah. You believe that? <laughs> <laughs> Let's read uh, chapter 5, from, from chapter 5, verse 1, alias chapter 4. Revelation 5, 1 says, And I saw in the, night, in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. Um, all right, there's, there's, there's three things that I want us to, to grasp here that are very, very important. Uh, which hand is it, ha is it in? The right hand. Uh, why would he specifically say right hand? Does the right hand mean something? And he said on the throne, a book, and that's the, the uh, Hebrew uh, Greek word biblion, and it actually means a roll. And this roll or this book, it's a scroll, it was written how? How was it written? Within and on the back side. So what does that mean? It was written on both sides. In other words, there was no more places to write anything. It was full of whatever was written there. This is, this is what he's relaying to us. 
So these, the three things is I want to talk about is, is the right hand and the book that's written on the front and the back and then sealed, the third thing, with the seven seals. This book is not only written on the front and the back, but is also sealed with seven seals. So I want to talk about these things, and I, I think that it'll be interesting to you. And I think you, you'll go out of here with even more assurance and more pieces of the puzzle to the book of Revelation. So let's talk first about the right hand. So uh, let's read uh, the paragraph uh, that's, uh, that's under that, that, that's the second paragraph down, that begins with John makes special mention. John makes special mention that the book was held in his right hand. John will again mention his right hand in verse 7. It was in the right hand that the Son of Man held the seven stars. Revelation 1, 16, 1, 20, and 2, 1. It will also be in the right hand upon which the mark will be received in chapter 13, 16. The right hand has special meaning. When studied, we find four basic de- uh, def- definitive uses of the right hand. The context will determine which we use to understand the image that's being projected. So that's, this is, I want to talk about this right hand deal. The right hand is a, is a very, very meaningful um, uh, thing to understand as far as, as understanding and interpreting scriptures. Uh, first of all, the right hand speaks of direction. Uh, Abraham told Lot, if you go to the right hand, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left hand, I'll go to the right. So we're, we're talking about you know, left and right, turning left or turning right. But in the context of what we're talking about here with, these, with, this, with this book, this biblion, this, this uh, scroll, th- we're not talking about directions. Who, who knows what's in this thing that's, that's sealed with seven seals? What, what's in here? What's he, what's he about to open up? You can answer. It's, it's not a trick question. I mean, you know, you, you all know this. It's the seals, the, the trumpets, the vials, all that bad stuff. Okay? So this, this is what's in here. So, so we not, when we're talking about left or right then that's not in context. So that's not going to work. So that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about a direction. The, the, another use of right hand is speaking of great blessings. The greater blessing is the person blessed with the right hand. Do you remember when uh, Joseph was bringing Ephraim and Manasseh before Jacob to be blessed? And he brought them up so that uh, Manasseh, which was the oldest, uh, would get the right hand blessing. And you remember what Jacob did is he crossed his hands and he put his right hand on, on Ephraim and his left hand on Manasseh. Now, Joseph made a big issue. He says, no, you're doing it wrong. You've got him, you, you, you're doing it wrong. He says, no, I'm, I'm doing right. And he gave, he gave Ephraim the greater blessing. So the, the blessing comes with the right hand. But again, we're not talking about blessings here. That's not the context of, of this scroll or this Biblion. Another use of it is in the, in the right hand is to make an oath. Even in the book of Revelation, angels will lift hands, both hands sometimes, to, to make an oath. But again, we're not making an oath here, so that's not going to work either. So what I want to do is, is to look at the context of what he's talking about here with this right hand thing. Uh, look on page 64 with me on the right column. And let's read some of these right-hand scriptures that I have here for you. And there's, and there's many, but I've just selected a, a few of them out of here out so we can look at them. Exodus 15, 6 says, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. So what do we see here about the right hand? Does it kind of fit in context with what's in the book of Revelation here? So we're starting to see now that this right hand situation is a hand of power. It's a hand that dashes the enemy into pieces. Exodus 15, 12 says, Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. There's, so we see the right hand being the hand of judgment. The right hand being the hand that, that can really bring, bring uh, the dashing. Uh, Psalms 21, 8 says, Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. 
So that's kind of what the book of Revelation is doing. In Psalms 98, 1, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. Psalms 110, verse 5 says, The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. So what do you see? I want to ask you, what do you see the right hand meaning here in context with with what's happening in Revelation chapter five. Hand of power. Hand of power. Wrath. Wrath. Destroys, enemies. Destroys enemies. All right, that's it. And he's made specific mention. It's in his right hand. Now let's carry this right hand thing on just just a little bit more. Come down to Lamentations two four there. He hath bent his bow like an enemy he stood with his right hand as an adversary and slew all that were pleasant to the eye in the tabernacle of the daughter of Zion. He poured out his fury like fire. Now, upon what people is this right hand coming? Is this like the world or... or Those, those of Israel, those that, that worshipped at the tabernacle. I want to um, say this, and then we'll read it. But I want to ask you, at which side is Jesus sitting? The right hand. The right hand. <laughs> and uh, this Biblion is in the right hand. It's the right hand of power and authority. The keys of death and hell are in the right hand. And so, and so we're starting to see the imagery here that, that John is wanting to give us, this apocalyptic imagery that we're looking at. Uh, let's read that next paragraph after Lamentations 2.4. It is necessary to insert here an important use in scriptures of the right hand. This is where our Lord Jesus is now seated in great power. Notice the power and authority associated with the right hand position of Jesus Christ. And there's a bunch of scriptures. Matthew, where all these say that he's seated at the right hand. This is, this is a major, major biblical doctrine. Uh, Matthew 26, 64, Mark 16, 19, Mark 12, 36, and 14, 62, Luke 20, 42. And all of those verses, all that I have there for you, all of those verses are speaking about Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand. It's a major biblical doctrine. Just to show you, we, we've taken the born again thing, which is only mentioned twice in the Bible, and made it a huge doctrine. But very few people understand the right hand. And again, even like we talked about with the cloud, how many scriptures we saw with the cloud and how few people understand that. So what we're talking about when we're talking about the right hand is a major biblical doctrine. So as we, as we can see, a major biblical doctrine is the Lord is now seated in the throne at the right hand. Now, let, let me show you something because this will start. It's another little link, another little piece to the puzzle that, that we're looking for here in the, in the book of Revelation. Do you remember in Matthew 64, Matthew 26, 64, uh, where Jesus was talking to the high priest? You know, they had arrested him. You saw it on the Passion of the Christ. And they arrested him and Caiaphas asked him, you know, are you the Christ? Are you the, the Son of God? And he says, I am. And the next time you see me, I'll be coming in the clouds with the right hand of power. Now, you didn't get that then because it did, you, wasn't, you wasn't aware of, of that thought. But I want to show you this. If you'll turn the page to page 65, there's the quote at the very top. Matthew 26, 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. <laughs> So all of a sudden now, the Biblion's in the right hand, Jesus is sitting at the right hand, and now Jesus is saying, I'm going to visit you with my right hand. <laughs> so it kind of gives you a little more insight into what we're, what, what, what we're seeing about the, about the book of Revelation. It's the right hand. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very important doctrine in the Bible. Uh, what he's saying here is that I'm going to take care of a little unfinished business. The 
he that sat upon the throne had the Biblion in the right hand, the scroll in the right hand sealed with seven seals written within and without. And, and the lamb is going to come and take it from his right hand. And so what, what God is saying here is there's a little bit of unfinished business with the high priest I need to take care of and with Israel as well. Uh, so I just thought that was a good thing I wanted to emphasize with you just a little bit. Do you like that? That's, that's, that's not a good teaching, isn't it? So there's the right hand. There's masses of scripture that you can look at in, there in the Bible about the right hand and the power and the authority. Okay, the, the, the next thing I wanted to, uh, to get from that verse of 5.1, we're going to spend the whole day just about there. We're going to get a lot done, but it, we're going to spend most of our time right there. Uh, it said that the Biblion was written, or the book, or the scroll was written within and on the backside. It was written on both sides. Have you ever noticed that before? Has anyone ever paid any attention to that before? Yeah, it means something. It, there's a link. It's one of those. It's one of those links that you, if you can find it, if you can find the link, it'll 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 open that up to you and help you understand what really is going on here. Uh, let's uh, let's see. I think I want to read. On page 65, yeah, the left column, middle way down, uh, where the paragraph begins with the Biblion was written within and on the backside. The allusion John is referring to, Ezekiel 2.3 and Exodus 32.15, those are the only other two places in all of the Bible where it talks about a writing of something on both sides. The book Ezekiel received was full of lamentations and mourning against Israel. There were so many that it filled the inside and the backside. Within was mourning and woe against Israel. So I want to read this right here. Ezekiel 2.3. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impotent children. Is that, that's not, how do you say that word? Im, im, impudent? impudent. I said it right. I said it didn't, didn't sound right. It didn't look right. Uh, impotent children, stiff-necked, I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are rebellious, they are a rebellious house, yet shall I know that, they have, that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them. Neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Is anybody kind of getting this rebellious thing? Are you seeing? This is the one, two, three, four, fifth time he said that. Verse 7 says, and thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. <laughs> for thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be thou not rebellious, like, <laughs> like that rebellious house. Is there a little redundancy here? Are you getting this? Like that rebellious house, open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And it spread it, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mournings and woe. Now, you know. As you start putting pieces of the puzzle together, we start seeing more and more and more along these same lines. Uh, should it not be considered 
that the revelation could be speaking to the rebellious nation of Israel and not to a futuristic people or in a futuristic doctrine. See, John makes a link that written within and written without. And if you're just not sitting down, going through the book of Revelation word by word, you just miss that. But those people wouldn't. No, they didn't. They understood it. When it was written within and without, that was an immediate link back to Ezekiel and what Ezekiel was saying. So they understood it. The Lamb's Book of Life, is that what you're, yeah, this is totally different. Yeah, this is, this, is the, this is the book that is in the right hand that has the seven seals and within it is all the, the vials and the trumpets and all of these horrible woes and lamentations that's going to come upon. Where's the, the, the Lamb's Book of Life, Revelation 20. I mean, where is it? What, what do you mean? Where, where is it held? Where is it at? It's just with the Lord. I don't know, the Lamb's Book of Life, I guess. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. 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 I can't tell you a specific. Huh? Oh, is it in his right hand as well? Okay. Okay. I understand. I uh, don't think it ever relates to that. I think it just relates to to the love. Your your name is written. Don't rejoice. Jesus told them, as the disciples came back from a from a uh, mission he had sent them on. Don't rejoice that devils are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So, uh, so that's you know that's I think that's Luke ten. So uh, there's, a, there's a link there, but I don't, I don't think it ever mentions now. Of course, your name is written in the book of Revelation. It talks about if your name is not found in the book of life, uh, then, you know, then there's waiting for you the lake of fire. So, but I don't think it ever relates to being in the right or the left hand or anything like that. Okay. Uh, so as we start looking at these things, we start seeing more and more and more along along the ways of, of this. Uh, um, and the puzzle begins to slowly come together. This is our seventh lesson. Uh, and I'm, of course, I'm picking specifics out to talk about. I'm just not talking about the, the things. I'm, I'm picking the specific things out. But I really want you to decide, you know, what is the book of Revelation truly about? You know, we've looked at, uh, we've looked at a lot of things, uh, like these things must shortly come to pass. Uh, the coming in the clouds so that they who pierced him would see him. Uh, John said that he was in and experiencing and a brother in the tribulation. Uh, there's the right hand that we're just what we're talking about now. And of course, Jesus telling the high priest that he would be coming to visit him. <laughs> uh, and now, you know, the Biblian thing uh, was written within and without. So I'm, I'm pointing these things out to you to make you aware of them. I didn't have anybody to point them out to me. You know, I just kind of had to research and research. And then as you start researching, you start eventually finding some books that help a little bit. And then you start opening it up to it. And then you, you find a book and a book will have references in it as well. So you get another book and, and, and all of a sudden, you know, you, you accumulate a little library on stuff that helps you a bunch then. But, to, but initially, you know, you have to kind of wade through stuff. And so this is what I'm trying to show you how to do when you're studying the book of Revelation. You know, you got to go slow a little bit and you got to you got to hook these things up. and You got to link them together to really find out what he's really talking about. So let's look at another piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle. He said that the Biblion that was written within and without was perfectly sealed with seven seals or it was sealed with seven seals, which is a number of totalness or perfection. And I, I go more with seven being the number of totalness. Uh, God created or recreated uh, the universe in seven days. And, and so all the feasts of Israel were to last seven days. Uh, their entire system was developed around the number seven, uh, like Daniel's prophecy was the 70 weeks, and they were in sevens, you know, 49. And sure, I mean, that's, this is, this is basic, basic it, basically it. And of course, it works out really well when you when you when you work it all through. But you know, we have to do a leap year every once in a while to to get the equinox and you know and the sun and all back where you know in, in line. But 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 yeah, but that's and that's kind of where it came from. But anyway, so seven is more to me of a totalness than than really a number of perfection. Uh, uh, the seals, when the seal, it, it simply means that it hasn't been opened. 
When something is sealed, that means that, you know, that it is preserved and it hasn't been opened. Now, what, what the seal was, it was, it was the, the scroll, it was the, the Biblion that was a rolled up paper, parchment. This is the image that he's projecting. And, and, and it, you know, we're, we're talking, there's not a rolled up parchment in, in heaven. I mean, that's not what we're really after here. But what, what he is really, he's trying to give us an image, a word picture. And this parchment that's rolled up is written on the inside and on the outside as well. And then it has seven seals where it's folded over the last. Now, what, the way they did this uh, is they would take hot wax and they would drip hot wax on there. And then they would put a, a, a ring signet into that wax and it would, it would be sealed. And there were seven of these, which, which just emphasizes the sealing. It was perfectly sealed. It was totally sealed. And no one could open it. And so it was still sealed. So what we're talking about now is, is this Biblion or this book that, uh, that John is now, is now looking at. Now, uh, what is it? What is this, this Biblion? What is this book? Um, look on uh, page 66, the left column. And let's read page 66. Where it starts there with however, there is a book. Now, what, what I've given you prior to this are a lot of the thoughts that different uh, teachers have come up with as to what this Biblion is. And then here's my conclusion. However, there is a book of which the scriptures speak that was once sealed but would be opened at the time of the end. What we must decide is whether this refers to the end of the earth or to the end of Israel's covenant with God. The following verses will help. So this is what Daniel wrote as Daniel was giving, given a prophecy. Daniel 12, 4 says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold... There stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how, shall, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held out up his right hand, and his left hand unto heaven, this is the making an oath, and swear by him that liveth forever that he shall be for a time's time and a half time. And, then, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now what I want, what I want us to see in, in verse 7 here is, is that we're not specifically talking about the end concerning the whole earth as we're talking about the people that are called the holy people. This is what Daniel's sealed book was really about. And then verse 8 says, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord. <laughs> I like it when it does that. I just, oh my Lord. You know. Time, time and a half time, there's no real designation. I mean, I'm sure that, that if we were to look back, we could probably find it something, something in there that would work. But I don't know of a, of a specific thing that, uh, that makes that work. Uh, I know that the 70 weeks of Daniel, uh, because of, of how it's broken down into sevens, you know, it, it works out. But it doesn't give us any kind of uh, uh, equational uh, algebraic. Maybe I can get Shirley on it. To, 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 <laughs> to, she just has graduated her algebra class. So, but maybe, I, you know, maybe, I, I, maybe we could find something, but I don't know of anything specific. And I heard it, but I understood not. Then, then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now, what we got to figure out is, it, is this time of the end, is it the end of the world? Or is it the end of Israel and the Mosaic system that it was under? 
Now, I know where we're leading, but we don't want to just jump there. You know, I know where, where we are already at in our, in our interpretation, but we don't ever want to just jump into that. We really want to see if this is what he's really talking about. Uh, so Daniel's prophecy was sealed till the time of the end. And so we're looking at now at the end of what? Uh, when would these things be? Uh, that when is the end times? What does the Bible talk about? How does the Bible talk about the end? What is it, what is it specifically saying about it? So uh, we're programmed, I think, to think anytime we read the time of the end or end time, or what we're, we're programmed to think the end of the world. But that's not what the Bible shows as the end times or the last times. So if you look in, uh, on page 66 on the right column over there, first of all, let's read... Read the, that same uh, from Daniel chapter 12, verse 7 from the NIV Bible. And it's a little bit clearer. And it says, The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for a time, times and a half time, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken. All these things will be completed. It's a little clearer when the power of the holy people have been broken. That will show that these things have been completed. That was the end that Daniel was talking about as Daniel sealed up his book. Now, in Acts 2.16, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. And it's interesting what he says. Uh, Let's read that, Acts 2.16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, to Peter, when the last days began and happened was when the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost and people began talking in tongues out on the streets and and the gifts of the Spirit and those kinds of things really began happening. And the Spirit of God was poured out. Peter says that was the last times. That's when the last times began. Let's read on there, uh, the next uh, paragraph. Peter declared that the last days had begun. The last days of what? The last days of Moses, not the last days of the earth. That was nearly 2,000 years ago. Peter ended his message with a warning to that specific generation. And we've, we've done the, the generation thing, but here's what Peter says to them after he had preached uh, in Acts chapter 2. He comes to a, a conclusion and it says that with, and with many other words did he, Peter, testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. In other words, that was the generation that all of the wrath of God, the right hand, those, the Biblion was going to be opened upon. That's what, that's what I'm seeing here is that this is where it's coming on. This, on that generation, the Peter, that generation was, the, Peter, the generation that Peter was a part of. Peter was speaking to that generation of his day. What meaning would it be to you or me nearly 2,000 years later to be saved from Peter's generation? What would it mean to us if we read this and say, save, our, save yourselves from this untoward generation? It doesn't mean anything to us, but it meant something to them because they understood this stuff. The reality is Peter's generation was the generation that would witness the end of Moses. Thus, it would be the generation that would experience the great tribulation. What is the book or the Biblion? Without a doubt, it is the book sealed by Daniel and opened at the end time of Moses. It is in his right hand, his power and authority and destruction, and has seven seals, perfect destruction. So as I'm looking at this and I'm starting to hook all this stuff up, and and I'm hoping you're kind of getting the same ideas as well, that we start seeing that these things are coming upon the nation of Israel. All the links lead to them. No link really leads to the end of the earth or the end of the planet or the end of humanity or any kind of cataclysmic thing like that. All the ends go point back to the nation of Israel as far as, 
as the Mosaic Covenant goes, as far as temple worship goes. These are the specifics. So, so this is what I'm seeing. Uh, so there's, there's the picture uh, that, that John writes to us and gives us. He says, I saw one that sat on the throne. And in his right hand, he had the Biblion. He had the book. And it was sealed perfectly with seven seals. And it was written within and without. And then he goes on and he says, you know, here it is. And, and he wants somebody to open it. And this is what chapter 5 is about. Chapter 5 is about who is worthy to open it. Who is worthy to open the book and the seven seals. So at the bottom of page 66, let's read Revelation 5.2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven, no angel, no saint that had gone on, nor in earth, people living, neither under the earth, people that had died, or people that were in hell, no one was able to open the book, neither to look therein. 5.4 says, and I wept much. What did, what did John do? Yeah. That's important. Here's a grown man crying because this Biblion could not be opened. And John obviously knew what was in there. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look therein. Uh, John obviously knew what was in it because he wept because it couldn't be opened. Now, that's, that's interesting to me because we know what's in there. We know that that thing is full of doom and gloom and vials and woes and all sorts of horror. All sorts of horrific stuff is about to be poured out. And, and John wanted it so desperately to be opened that he did what? He wept. And it says he wept now, a little bit. He wept much. So, so here's, here's what's going on. You know, I mean, it, 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 this is amazing when you, when you just start seeing it. Why, John, do you want all this devastation to come? What is it? You know, what is it that, that, that you're after here? <laughs> Read with me on page 67 in the left column uh, where it starts with all agree on this verse. All agree on this verse, no one was able to offer a better covenant, and until there was a better covenant, the old covenant would stand. The Lord God Almighty is ready to end Moses, but for 1,500 years, no man was found worthy to open and to read the book. It wasn't that the Lord God did not want to terminate the old covenant sooner. He knew the old had faults, and he sought for the second. However, creation must wait for the testator. Now, I want you to read Hebrews 8, 7, and, and verse 13 with me. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. And then verse 13, this is, this is an amazing verse. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth, and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. John said the old covenant was ready. I mean, the writer of Hebrews says the old covenant is ready to vanish away. It's ready to go. It's decayed. It's rotten. It waxes old. And it's ready. John wanted the old covenant to end so that the new covenant could come forth. Uh, have you ever noticed that in Hebrews 8.13? That the, it says it's, it's decaying. It's old. And, and, and the Lord really wants to replace it. <laughs> the, it's interesting because you know, we've, 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 we've commented already about about John wept much. We've talked about how Peter said this is the last times, uh, uh, you know, get away from this untoward generation. And then, and then he says, uh, the author of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews now says this thing. The, the Bible writers, the authors, the apostles, those that wrote and the people in, in the first century 
knew that some devastation was coming upon that generation. They knew it. And the books are, are constantly you know, alluding to that, but we take it because we're programmed to think end times means the end of the world. That's not at all what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches is this, this the end of the Old Covenant. It's the end of Mosaic worship. It's the end of, of that. That great tribulation was going to be poured out. Those seals, those vials, those trumpets were all going to come upon that, that generation. That generation would not pass. The Bible writers and apostles and the people knew that something horrific was about to come upon, even, even ready to come upon that religious system. Jesus had said so, and all the writers knew that it was decaying. It was done. And so John wept much. Hmm. Let's read, read page 67, Revelation 5.5. 5. As soon as I can find it. Is it on page 67? Yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Someone was found worthy. He was the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, I'm not going to get into it, but uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah speaks about being the root of David. This is, um, it talks about uh, the, the scepter aspect of his kingship, the right hand, the authority, the, the roar of the king. You know, that's the lion aspect. But when John turned... To see the lion, what did he see? The elder says, okay, behold, don't stop weeping, stop crying. We've got somebody that's going to open it for us. <laughs> uh, he says, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he said, and I turned to see that lion. Verse 6 on the right bottom corner says this. And behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts... Now, where is he now? Now he's in the throne. In the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, he's in the middle of the beast, these creatures, these people, characteristics of people, temperaments of all the people, and of the midst of the elders, all the things that we've talked about today, stood a lamb as it had been slain. John recognized that lamb. John had seen that lamb. John knew that lamb. He was standing there with John. It was John the Baptist that said to, to John the Revelator, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the earth, sins of the world. And, and so he recognized that Lamb. He says there was a Lamb as though it had been slain. He saw it slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So there is the second great revelation of Jesus Christ. And the first revelation, the first great revelation was him standing in the seven, in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And now here's the second great revelation. And the book of Revelation, as we've talked about, is made up of four. This is the second one. And there he is. And he's in the midst of the throne. He's, he's in the midst of the elders. He's in the midst of the creatures. He's in the midst of humanity. He is central. I got goosebumps right there. That's, that's, that's good. That's good. He's, he is the center of everything. He is Jesus the Christ, the Lamb slain. Now, I don't want to get into all the horns and the highs and all that stuff. I've got that written for you there. We may talk about it next time, but you can read. I just want to close today's lesson with, with telling you and showing you that this is a picture of, of the ascension. What's happening in Revelation chapter 5, John's giving us a word video of Ascension Day. When Jesus ascended in the cloud and received his kingdom, uh, he was the slain lamb, and he took the Biblion, and he now is in the throne. Is that going to happen one day, or has that already happened? What do you think? If it was on Ascension Day, it would have already happened, right? He, so he's not going to receive a kingdom or receive all authority, because I think he said he's already been given all authority in heaven and in earth. And so he's received his kingdom, and now he's in the throne. And Daniel, chapter 7, visioned 
this moment. He envisioned what John was describing to us in Revelation chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 7, you can write these notes, all these verses, references down. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13, Daniel writes, And I saw in a night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, he, he that sat in the throne, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him, and there was given him dominion, and glory, and a kingdom, that all people, and nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So what John is giving us a word video of in Revelation chapter 5 is Ascension Day. What Daniel saw happening was Ascension Day. When Jesus rose in the clouds, came before the Ancient of Days, he that sat upon the throne, and received his kingdom, received that Biblion received all authority, received all power. Um, now, I don't know how you read this uh, in, in conjunction with a lot of the theology of today, but it says his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. Uh, before that, it says there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. When did he receive his kingdom? At Ascension Day. And he received that, and so what John was writing to us would have happened on Ascension Day. And then it says, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Uh, if it's everlasting, is there going to be a parenthetical seven years of tribulation in there? Or three and a half years? Or, or, or any time, one day? Not if it's everlasting, right? And so as I read those things, you know, and as I put all this stuff kind of together, you know, and get references from other guys, because sometimes you honestly think you're going crazy. Uh, and, you, and you start hooking it all up together. You start seeing what the book of Revelation is really talking about. And it's not talking about a faraway doctrine or a faraway time. It's talking about a great tribulation that came upon a people that terminated an old covenant, an old religious system, so that the Lamb could sit upon the throne and he could receive his, his power and his kingdom. All right, any thoughts, any, any, any questions, any, any things you'd like to ask me about that I didn't make clear or I've done my best? It wasn't really the covenant, God's part of the covenant, it was what man had done. Right, right. right. God, Christ said he didn't come to abolish the law, he came to fulfill, fulfill it. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They were constantly, you know, adding, and he said, uh, he said, by your traditions, you've made the word of God of none effect. And, of course, what they, were, what they were getting after him about at that time was washing his hands. And he says, it's not what goes into the man that defiles the man. It's what comes out of the man. That's what defiles the man. And so he says, by your traditions, you've made the covenant useless. You've made the word of God useless because you've taken away what it was really there to do, and you made it of none effect. Absolutely. But it was time for it to, to terminate. It was time for it to, to end. Yeah, something like that, yeah. That they added. That they added. <laughs> that they added. <laughs> and together we can change.